Hello, hello everyone, and welcome to our first video of Aries Day 3, Global Economic Issues, where honestly we have the choice of looking at many different areas, and I always choose to go with globalization and free trade, and some other kind of like international transaction type issues. Main reason is, a lot of the choices you have in this area of study will never be relevant again in VC economics. It might be if you study economics at university, good luck with that, but um, for, in terms of what we do, I want to do things for you that are going to benefit you next year. And so we're going to start off this whole like last bit of term with two videos, one about globalization, one about free trade. And then if you're in my class at school, which might be like probably like 12 people that watch this, um, we're going to go into a group assignment where you do kind of a task about trade amongst Australia and another country and a lot of information about that, which will be a presentation of sorts. And then we will get back into talking about like exchange rates, net foreign debt, and a few other things that will be very important next year before we go into uh, full on exam revision. But today we're going to be talking about globalization. So first up, globalization, what it is. We live in a very different world now to what your parents lived in or your parents' parents lived in. It's been changing significantly the last 20 to 30 years. There has been a whole technological like boom in the world. And thanks to the internet, now the barriers that were, did exist between countries have gotten smaller and smaller and the world slowly started to merge into this like one unified economy and that's good and bad you'd argue this year that because of covid kind of things have fractured a little bit and we've kind of gone away from this a little bit um, which is ironic to learn about this now but it's still really important and it will continue to be important as we go through the coming years so globalization involves the removal of tr trade barriers limiting free movement of business, trade, investment, and even labor across borders. So it's the fact that like uh, people can move a little bit freely, more freely between countries. Business can occur a lot more freely between countries. An easy example of that, if you wanted to so say like this bobblehead right here, if I want to go online right now, I put this online and I could sell this Ron Swanson online to anyone in the world because of globalization. 20 years ago, I would have to go to like a local market or put this in the paper as like one Ron Swanson bobblehead, bobblehead uh, $20 or best offer and would have had to wait. I could only sell it some, to someone locally or in Australia. Another example of that, so a friend, now I'm just like, this has just become show and tell. A friend brought this back from Japan a couple of years ago, which is Pikachu dressed as Mario. And so thanks to globalization, I have this. It just sits here. I don't do anything with it. Eleanor will probably get it and draw on it. But thanks to globalization, you can get this in Australia, even though it was only in Japan. And so that's part of globalization. Things getting a lot more like free. Everything is available to you. You can have an idea of anything you want. Google those words and buy it from anywhere in the world. It will get delivered to your house and probably like up to between a day and four weeks, depending on where you are. Um, and that is amazing. You could invest in America or any other country right now, and there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Or well, sometimes there will be, like sometimes some countries have things that prevent you from doing that. But for the most part, we are moving towards a freer world where you can do business, trade, invest, or move to anywhere in the world freely. And they're expecting that to happen more and more as we go through the coming years. And there are a few reasons for that we're going to get into. So some of the things that prevent globalization from occurring, so some barriers or protection that exists. Um, sometimes countries put this in place to try and protect their local businesses. They're trying to push more and more to move away from it. So things like tariffs. Tariffs are just a tax on selling a good or service. Um, a good example of that this year, China was a bit upset with Australia when our Prime Minister Scott Morrison accused them of a um, like big cyber hacking thing with the government. And then China in response did not like that and put a 150% tariff on our barley exports. So if anyone in China wanted to buy Australian barley, they had to pay a ridiculous amount extra. And that hurt local business. Like that's a barrier to well, prevent our trade really. There are import quotas where it limits a certain amount of a certain good or service from being imported into a country. It means that hopefully that will protect local producers because we can't just buy them all from cheaper options overseas. There are subsidies which we have moved away from in recent years. 
Uh, the automotive industry in Australia used to be propped up by subsidies quite a bit because our wage costs made us really not competitive in automotive manufacturing. And the government would give those automotive industries subsidies so they could keep operating to keep jobs in Australia. Eventually they realized that wasn't really effective because it didn't encourage the um, car companies to be efficient and cut their costs because they just expect the government to keep bailing them out. And eventually they took those subsidies away. Currently, we give a lot of a decent amount of subsidies to farming, um, which is good. They need it because of drought, etc. And currently, the biggest subsidy that exists is JobKeeper, which is a wage subsidy, which currently exists in the COVID pandemic to pay the wage costs of certain businesses to prevent them from shutting down during the lockdowns and the pandemic itself. And then we also have anti-dumping legislation, which is all about a country can't just dump a whole lot of their excess stock in another country at a really cheap price to hurt their local businesses. Then we've got the growth of globalization and why it has occurred. So some of the reasons why globalization has occurred, there's been some relaxation of government controls to so deregulation, we're moving towards more capitalist economies in most of the world, meaning that businesses can decide what they want to produce and how much of it to produce. Whereas in the past, the government had a lot more control of what is made in each country and controlled the country itself. We've got better transport and communication, so things can travel a lot quicker via the air, etc. And communication, the internet, we can buy things a lot quicker online. Communication's a lot better online. Business can exist in multiple parts of the world and communicate very quickly, which is pretty incredible. We've got new technology, which produces things a lot quicker. Have you seen 3D printers? It's amazing what they can do. Um, and so things can get produced at a lot, like better of a rate, at a faster rate, and a lot cheaper, and therefore, um, I remember I used to always use the example and I still use the example. If I remember when TVs first had HDMI cables um, and I went to JB Hi-Fi to buy a HDMI cable, it was like the cheapest one was $40. And I remember going on eBay when I got home and I bought one for 99 cents with free postage from Hong Kong. And you might say that's probably a bad quality one. I'm still using it, it's still good, it's fine. It's like 10 years later and it's still great. And so it always blew my mind because in Hong Kong, they can make that HDMI cable so cheaply and ship it for free. Like I can't, I can't even imagine that. Like 99 cents with free shipping from Hong Kong. And if I want to send a letter in the same town that I live in Australia, it will cost me a dollar. It will probably take weeks to get there. And so that's kind of a real difference in um, parts of the world, their technology and how they use it to get them cheap production. We've got mobility of investment. If a country is no longer happy with their cost of production in one country, they can move offshore. It's happened a lot in Australia. A lot of call centers move offshore to get cheaper labor elsewhere. We have a lot of production move offshore to like India and parts of Asia to produce with cheaper labor. Um, and that way they can divide their costs and produce where things are cheapest to give them a competitive advantage and then perform as well as possible. And the promise of better material living standards for all. If every country focuses on areas that they're good at, that they have competitive advantages in, then they are going to maximize their living standards because they're gonna have the most jobs. They're gonna have really good rates of pay because there's gonna be a lot of demand for what they're producing. If they're the best at it, the rest of the world will want theirs. It's the reason why we don't grow rice in Australia. We're not good at it. We don't have to climb it for it. So we will buy it from places that do have it. And that will create jobs in those places because there's more demand for it. In Australia, we'll have like wool, we'll have beef, we'll have barley and wheat because we're good at making those things. We'll also have iron ore because we have a lot of mines that we'll um, send people into and pay them a lot of money to do it. So some reasons for globalization, reasons why it is good. It helps to minimize labor costs. We can produce things in areas where labor is the cheapest or the firms are the most efficient. Therefore, we can minimize costs, maximize profit. Profit is great. We've got increased access to natural resources. We don't have a lot of natural resources in Australia. Well, we have a lot, but we don't have a variety of them. And we need a lot that other countries have. And it gives us access to those. It helps firms gain economies of large scale production, which means um, hopefully if you've done accounting, there are these things that exist. Um, I'm gonna try and draw them. But if we were to draw, oh, that is atrocious. So if your cost as a business, you've got fixed, You've got um, variable costs that go up with that as you produce more. And you've got fixed costs that are a straight line. That is not a straight line at all. Your fixed costs don't change. You've got other costs that might increase the amount of resources that you use per each bit of production. But the more and more you produce, 
the lower percentage of your overall costs, those fixed costs become. So think of it this way, no matter how much you produce, your rent is $100. The more you produce, the cheaper that rent comes as a proportion of your overall production. So if you produce 100 things, that rent is costing you a dollar per thing you produce. If you produce 1,000 things, that rent's only costing you 10 cents per unit. So your fixed costs become a lower percentage of your overall costs because you're producing on a much larger scale, and we call that economies of large scale production. It also helps take advantage of government policies. Some countries have really good tax incentives for certain things. Um, a big example of this recently in Australia is we keep trying to get movies to film in Australia and we offer them massive tax cuts to film here. So for example, Thor Ragnarok was filmed on the Gold Coast and they gave them massive tax benefits for doing that. Um, and they got to film the next Thor film in Australia because of the same reason. Um, and the Australian government's often trying to get things in here because it's great for our tourism, it's great for local businesses, and that benefits things in a lot of ways. Um, other countries, like for example, Google had their headquarters in, I think it was Ireland for a long period of time because Ireland basically charged them no tax. And they wanted that because they wanted to make the most money possible. So they took advantage of those government policies. It helps minimize transport costs. It, with globalization, you can have headquarters all over the world and therefore minimize how far you've got to send things, um, which is great. And increases flexibility in decision-making because you can um, obviously weigh up many different things. You might want to produce things in China because it's cheap with labor. Or you might want to produce things locally so you don't have shipping costs. You've got all of those options available because you can freely go around and do things where it's going to be best for your business overall. And lastly, some of the effects of globalization in Australia. So in Australia, we have lower inflation rates because of globalization, we can get things cheaper. So the price of goods and services doesn't increase as much because we can always buy cheap things from overseas, which means the local producers have to keep their prices competitive and not increase them insanely. Higher economic growth and productivity. Up until this year, where we've now dropped into a recession with negative 7% economic growth um, in the most recent quarter and negative in the quarter before that, Economic growth has been going in Australia for over 20 years. We've had positive growth for that long, partly due to globalization, people demanding our iron ore exports, our beef exports, our wool, our barley, and that has been very a positive effect of it. And even in the pandemic, we're doing not too bad compared to other countries and our exports are still doing all right. And mining starting to do all right again, which is interesting. Inequality has become worse. One of the downsides of globalization is that the people who benefit from it tend to be the people who own the businesses, etc. And so the rich get richer and the poor might get poorer because we are sending um, production to countries where labor is getting questionable rates of pay. And we're not paying um, low grade workers here because they cost too much by comparison. And consumer choice is greatly increased, which is awesome. Um, I remember just when I was a kid, like before internet shopping was a big deal. I could only go to like the local shopping center for things. If they didn't have it, you just didn't get it. And so, whereas now I can go look at the shops, but then I'm like, well, I want this in a different color and look at everyone that exists ever and then decide what I want to get. And that's amazing. That's a real great benefit of globalization. And so that's it for globalization. That's everything you need to know for right now. There are going to be some questions that you've got to work on after this. But, well, what's next? We talked about it a little bit at the start. We're going to be talking about free trade um, in the next class, which for my class will be Friday. Um, you're going to have a group assignment coming up, which we'll talk about next week um, to get you started on before the holidays. We'll finish it off at the start of next term. Before we get into covering some year 12 stuff that's relevant to the, this topic, so exchange rates, net foreign debt, a thing called the balance of payments, and then exam revision for your end of year exams, which are coming up in a year where you have spent the least time at school of all time. Other than that, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. But um, it's been great talking to you as a microphone and a camera and not actually seeing anyone as has been my life for like six months of this year. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time.